Hello everyone, wastelanders, adventurers, soon to be spacefarers. I'm Kato Genesis. This is my co-host Bad Company Sarge. Hello there. And this is the Pipcast 3000, a bi-weekly podcast where we talk about something usually but that's related as our topic and we also talk about some gaming news and stuff like that. I'm I'm thinking of like renaming this <gasps> the the Starcast. Just a working oh. title for for like <laughs> the next few months, just because like pretty much all we're gonna be talking about going forward for at least three plus months. Yeah, I think. Yeah, you'll like, have to check the names of other Starfall podcasts already out there. Yeah, we're we're over a hundred episodes in. I think I think the name sticks. <laughs> we're over a hundred episodes in on this version of the Pipcast as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Add yeah, in yeah. the other one, and what we're looking at, like a couple of hundred, maybe. Uh, the, the other Pipcast, we didn't. I don't know if we had that many. Uh, yeah. I want to say like thirty something episodes. Uh, It'd been a long time. I was time. thinking like forty, and I don't know how I got forty plus one hundred and sixteen to be like two hundred, but you know, r- round up to the nearest hundred. Retired content. Oh my God, there's twelve hundred videos, Tony. <laughs> Where is your filing system? <laughs> anyway, getting super sidetracked. Um, our topic is going to be the Q and A that Will Shen and Emil Pagalolo did um, yep. uh, on Discord, and it wasn't really like publicly posted. Uh, besides on like Twitter, and it was just like the Cliff Notes version of it. Um, so Sarge and I both like said the same thing at the same time like why don't we talk about the q a because like not many people may see it or hear about it yeah um but we also have it linked down below if you want to go like to the official but that's a discord where it's posted um mm-hmm. or look at that tweet just for the the basic uh what what we talked about or what they talked about kind of thing um but before that point we have a comment of the cast and also the newsy stuff um sarge would you please take the comment sure so travis fletcher here saying perfect listening choice for dying to the fat man raider on survival in lexington a couple dozen more times thank god for starlight driving at least (laughs) yes i just don't deal with that enemy in survival mode it's not worth it it's just not worth it yeah it's it's a cheap shot every time yeah um I yeah, uh, when I play survival, I I kind of avoid that whole section of the map until because like I know it's like designed as like raiders in normal difficulties to like go to um, the Corvega factory and stuff like that and yeah. just go into the Lexington area kind of thing. But if you try that in survival mode, you're probably gonna die a lot. If you're playing <laughs> as a sniper, you can do it all right. Because yeah. that's how I typically play survival. And if you're just patient and kind of pick off the enemies outside, you can then kind of sneak your way in. And it's not too bad, but it is definitely the first big jump up in difficulty in survival. It's mm-hmm. even then, it's it's dangerous. Yeah. So what we're saying, Travis, is you're pretty hardcore. And thank you for the comment. Let's get into. Well, the first thing, which is the the Starfield preload, is up for Microsoft Store. So if you have if you have it on the Microsoft Store on Windows, you should be able to preload. I don't think Steam is available yet, um, but I also believe that Xbox console is. Yeah. Does that make I mean, sense? If, yeah. If you've pre-ordered Starfield, just double check if you can preload it. Yeah. If yeah. you don't have it now, it will likely come soon. That that makes more sense. You said it a lot more eloquently than. I just did. I'm tired. I'm <laughs> going to be very short on sentences today. <laughs> I'm all for efficiency, Sarge. <laughs> Ten minute podcast. Let's go. <laughs> um, also, this is your your warning slash reminder that Starfield is getting closer. People are getting their keys. So if you want to avoid Starfield spoilers, now is the time to be more avoidant of social medias and Reddit and other such forums where you can accidentally see information you may not want to yeah um there are people out there trying to spoil the game so yeah there are people enjoying ruining it for everybody else um i remember like 
right before Fallout 4's release. Like, it is, I, I talk about it once in a while, especially when this topic comes up, is, like, I decided to stream, uh, just an editing stream before Fallout 4 came out. Yeah, somebody, uh, somebody popped in the chat and just spoiled one of the main plot points of Fallout 4. And I had that forever, forever ruined. So if you don't want something like that to happen, be vigilant. Avoid uh, sources of random people yep. saying crap about a game you haven't played yet. <laughs> yeah. Also, don't post spoilers yourself. And if you've heard something where you don't know if it's a spoiler or not, don't then go around on public forums going, Hey everyone, I heard this thing. Do you think it's a spoiler? I don't know. Because... I hate those people even more than the ones who intentionally do it. <laughs> the ones who are just like, I'm not sure if this is a spoiler. I better tell everyone. <sighs> yeah. It, it's like, yeah, that that reminds me of, of, you know, the ones that like to, I don't know if this breaks a rule or anything like that, yep. and, then, and then proceeds the to break the rule. same mindset. <laughs> just don't. Uh, yeah. Or like, when you say, with all due respect, you're going to say something disrespectful. Like, just don't. Just don't. Just be nice. Just be good. Just be a good gamer. Just be a nice person. That's all you gotta do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody who is a cool Fallout fan, at least when it comes to making a Fallout animation, is this person... Uh, their channel's called uh, Nike Travnikov? See, I and... have pronounced it Nike. Nike? Yeah, I'm not sure which one's right, though. <laughs> oh, Okay. Well, it's spelled Nike, so... It doesn't have the uh, accent over the E. Nike usually doesn't. Does it not? No. What? But... It doesn't. It's just N-I-K-E. I worked at a shoe shop for years. <laughs> I really <laughs> should know that. Okay. Well, <laughs> Nike Travnikov made something called Fallout, a hollow flame cinematic, which shows a uh, wonderfully... 3D rendered um, recreation of a Fallout 1 kind of scene? Not recreation. Creation of a Fallout 1 style scene with a shrouded seemingly power armored figure um, approaching a console opening a door and finding a recognizable FEV beastie inside and it's really cool. Yeah. I don't know if anything more is going to come out of this. <laughs> But it's a very well done animation. Oh, yeah. it's a Brotherhood of Steel. Um, somebody wearing Brotherhood armor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is they're... a lovely point as well at like one forty ish where you see like the old school screen and you get super Fallout 1 vibes of like the little reflection of the power armor. That bit I particularly love. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. Um, yeah, it's just really well done. I I hope this person gets more views. Like they they already got, fortunately, ten thousand views at one hundred forty three subscribers. So they they got picked up by some place on the internet. Um, yeah. But I I hope they they gain all they can from that and continue to make more. And I mean, it gives me kind of yeah. a Warhammer forty k Eternus. I think it was called Vibes, and I know that got picked up quite big time. I think the creator got like hired to make stuff or something. So we've already What's seen that it's possible to have big success from making these little trailers and shorts and stuff. So uh, fingers crossed. A, a start, a startus, a startus. That's uh, one. Yeah, just wanted to double check and see what that was because yeah, that one was that one was really cool and metal as well. You get a very similar I vibe from like this trailer. Mm-hmm. I'm calling so, it a trailer. It's a cinematic. It's not a trailer for anything. This is it. I, Go watch it, looks, it now. It, it looks trailer quality, though. So, yeah. I mean, you this can call it a trailer. This could be a trailer for a Fallout spinoff game. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they want to, yeah. if Bethesda just gets in touch and like, hey, we want to make Fallout a hollow flame. Boom. Done. I also enjoy seeing that rather than seeing what Wizards of the Coast is deciding to do with the Magic Ooh. The Gathering property. Oh no! Go ahead and have your little rant, Kato. Let me just let me just rip the bandaid off for everybody else. Hey, Magic: The Gathering is doing a crossover with Fallout for some reason. Oh, I know the reason. It's money. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's the main reason. Yeah, 
I so, would say I'm not half as annoyed about this as you clearly are. I mean, you've put it down <laughs> in the thing as Wizards ignore TES The Elder Scrolls teases Fallout MTG set. Yeah. Could, for Kado, that may as well have been typing in just a string of curse words. That's about as harsh <laughs> as the language gets. I don't know how, how well I can describe it. Uh, Magic the Gathering has had this weird money first aggressive downturn over the last couple of years or maybe more than that now um where like they had the secret layers and stuff like that like all this crossover yeah. stuff that they're doing it's clearly extremely successful yep. but the quality is also dropping pretty sharply um like even going down to like the actual card quality oh, okay. um i the fact that i'm bringing it up only you know tells more people about it but I'm all for not supporting it. <laughs> well, if it makes you like, feel any better, I uninstalled Magic the Gathering Arena the other day. Good job. Immediately I'm after reinstalling it to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> I installed it, I was like, okay, it's got an update, 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 update. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at this, let's take a look at this. I'm not going to play this, uninstall. <laughs> it was a great journey. I built it's, half the deck. <laughs> You're describing me in 76. Oh no. See, 76 very is similar. the advantage of being a bigger file size. So that stops I, me from doing it. I, I didn't reinstall it. I, I just booted it up to be like, oh, I'll check it out for, for a few minutes, see what's new mm -hmm. with the new scoreboard and whatnot. I looked at, this, at the storefront, noticed that there was another pay-to-win item, and I was like, no, nah, and then I uninstalled it. Ah, <laughs> oh, I did have something to say about the fallout in Magic the Gathering thing. And oh. with you saying, like, how they're ignoring the Elder Scrolls. Which would still yeah. be the same problem that you have. <laughs> like, they're still just cashing in on money. It, it would still be the same problem I have, but it, it's something that I that I noticed that would have made a lot more sense, given what Magic the Gathering is. While um, Magic the Gathering is primarily, like, medieval-style fantasy, the whole swords and sorcery thing... They have done some more sci-fi stuff. They already have artificers and the like, which already bridges the gap somewhat. But I know they've had like some cyberpunk stuff, just as standard within their own standard sets. Yeah, like, I guess that's they're, true. they're not averse to sci-fi, but they are primarily the like more medieval fantasy. Yeah. But my point was going to be that. I think Fallout has a better range of actual unique things as opposed to the Elder Scrolls mm. and like the Elder Scrolls has a lot of very traditional fantasy elements like if we look at the uh, races you can play as in the Elder Scrolls like orcs three varieties of elves and varieties of men that's all just standard fantasy stuff immediately that's already exists with the Magic the Gathering to some degree it's only really the Khajiit and the Argonians who stand out. And with the Khajiit, you've already got Leonin, who are MTG's version of that. And with the Argonians, there's probably something as well. Uh, there are, but, but I forgot what they're called. Yeah, I was going to make a deck of them. Either. <laughs> my cards um, are just sitting under my bed, gathering dust. I've got cards all around me, but none of them are helpful. <laughs> that would take a long time to read through them all. But yeah, there's. I feel like with Fallout, you have, because of a mutated creatures and stuff you have more elements that way which probably makes it a bit easier to just come up with a lot of like basic creature cards and stuff mm -hmm. especially because fallout's gone heavier in the variations and making variations actually look different as opposed to like having seven different types of draugr who all look pretty much the same uh, that, that was my little bit of thinking on it i understand uh, it i guess a little bit more i still don't like it yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I, I still do kind of agree with you on the whole. They're just going for these collaborations for a bit of quick cash. It's, yeah. None of them really excite me that much. Especially because you don't get, like, interesting story and stuff with them. Which is one of the things I do like about Magic the Gathering. I love yeah. the whole Phyrexians and Slivers and all of that stuff and seeing what Nicol Bolas is up to and, and making it sound much more friendly than all of these apocalypses I'm describing. <laughs> Magic the Gathering has some really interesting stories. It's also got some terrible ones. There's real mm -hmm. bad things that happen because they have like various different authors and stuff work on the books. 
<laughs> so you'll occasionally see a character like have a character arc get halfway through it and then a different author comes along and is just like no i'm gonna take back everything that was done there oh <laughs> yeah I, f I feel like there was a chandra was it a chandra one i feel like chandra was like going on a like romance arc and a friendship arc and all of that stuff I and mean, then it was just immediately reverted, like, halfway through the story. And just, oh. like, summed up in one line as, like, yeah, I never really felt that way properly. But anyway. Fallout cards. Go buy them, everyone. No. That was our message, right? That's, no, no. <laughs> our message was, in fact, the opposite, Sarge. Oh, no. What have I done? <laughs> well, you know who else has made a giant mistake that we should all hate them for? Nintendo. Oh, yeah, well... I'm already on board. <laughs> I mean, I went a bit hard on that, but... <laughs> Generally speaking, yeah. So, um... Yeah. Oh, wait. I I should mention something. Like, this... this The Pipcast is supposed to be every other week. Man, I'm so oh, yeah. late for this. It's supposed <laughs> to be every other, every other week, but I, I postponed for an extra week because I wasn't feeling good. <laughs> Just wasn't feeling up to up to recording. And then we just waited a week. So, sorry. Oh, I was supposed for those to record of you who like consistency. two podcasts last week. I logged I on know. for this one and Kato was like, sorry, can't do it. I immediately saw that and was like, okay, it's a couple of hours before the next one. Shut off the computer. Wait a couple of hours. Turn it back on. Turn it back on. And then the person for the other one's like, sorry, guys, not going to be able to do it this week. <laughs> <laughs> I went from more podcasts than I'll ever be doing at once to nothing. It was... Ah. Uh, well, if I knew about that, Sarge, we could have done a follow-up. It's fine. Anyway, back to the Nintendo thing. <laughs> oh, uh, actually, before we go back... Speaking uh, of letting Sarge down... Yeah. <laughs> no, obviously, <laughs> Starfield launches or is playable for us on the uh, first. Yeah, which is just under two weeks away. So... Uh. There might be some more iffiness with Pipcast's schedule seeing as we'd be recording like 48 hours after the game had gone live 24 hours mm. maybe yeah it's we'll see there'll be a bit of a diversion to the standard scheduling over the next episode or two probably hey, they'll they still exist in some capacity we're not going mm -hmm. away we're just going all over the place we're just going out to the country all right Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> they they filed a whole bunch of patents, more than 30 of them. Public 32 specifically, although 31 of them are specifically tied to Zelda Tears of a Kingdom and its mechanics. So you know how you can like stick stuff together? Mhm. Mm you fuse it. Um no. No one else is allowed that. Don't don't do it. Just us. Okay? You have to say yes or I'll sue you. More than thirty patents. Where the frick is the list? Why Nintendo nudes needs to do better. Cause like it it, it links to Yeah, it links to just a really things that don't, that don't make sense to what they're posting about. Yeah. And they're linking to their own stories. Where did you find this this Nintendo news site, Sarge? <laughs> I mean, this was just kind of a short, easy one. Uh, uh, they've hmm. got their source here as well. I'll, I'll link that to you if you want, like, the 50-page sort of thing. Automaton. Bits. The loading screen sequence. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's other a games choice. better not be loading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah. Let me let me actually grab that one for our for our better source. Okay. Yeah. So, um, not always the biggest fan of when stuff like this happens. Um, I understand protecting certain properties, but the other example that we have is like the Nemesis system and Warner Brothers yep. just kind of sitting that was on that up so much. Yeah, and like that just means that it stifles other developers wanting to use a similar system because like you know it's it's in the property holders hands to determine like what is 
at least it feels like it to me what is considered you know overstepping yeah. kind of thing and when um, it's in your best interest to count pretty much everything you can get away with as overstepping that's, mm -hmm. that's not great yeah and this is Nintendo yep. who <laughs> is very well known for way overstepping when it comes to their IPs yeah, so I, mean, I feel like it was pretty recently that Nintendo was okay with people posting Nintendo content on YouTube it was like years of Nintendo just being like oh no 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 <laughs> you can't be doing that I mean, they they they'll they're still iffy depending on what it what the context is. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think they have their do they have their partner program anymore? No idea. I I just stay away from Nintendo in general. Same. <laughs> it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. It's like sure, I'll never get to play Mario or Zelda or those sort of games, but you know what? I, I can live without that. I'd rather just not have stress. Yeah. And miss out on a few great games. Same. Same. Very much so. <laughs> yeah. Um, like I, I still wanted to play Monster Hunter Generations, but it's only on Switch. Oh, that that's oh well. you know, playable for me. Uh and I I can't be bothered. I also don't play my consoles enough as is, and just asking to borrow Kite's console to play is you know that's an extra step. I'm not I'm I am not i am good. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I've seen pretty much universal negativity towards Nintendo fire filing all of these patents, including plenty of like game devs on Twitter and stuff just being like, yeah, this is a bad move for the industry as a whole. Because mm -hmm. it's just super restrictive. Y yep. You see it a lot with, I mean, copyright in general, just like people taking it a bit too far and not copywriting their very specific thing for a like a limited amount of time but being like no one is ever able to allow to touch anything even like this is yep. the new kind of standard and a large part of it's Disney's fault and I'm not going to go into that rant now because <laughs> <laughs> it's a long one well that's okay um, we can get upset about something else man there's a lot of Upset gamers. I mean, you did Sad post stuff. a lot of the links, Sad so. Stuff. Okay, let's go, Sarge. Take Two CEO says a fifty dollar price tag on the multiplayer free multiplayer list is the better way of saying it. PS4 and yeah. Switch port of Red Dead Redemption One is commercially accurate. Actually. 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 <laughs> the actually, this uh, takes so much tone. Uh, okay, so give give us give us a summary here, Sarge. So there's two main reasons people are annoyed. So the Red Dead Redemption 1, it, it was, first it was like, oh, there's going to be a remake and stuff, and yeah, it's really cool. So then people were annoyed that it was just coming to PS4 and Nintendo Switch. So they were like, hey, what about Xbox? What about PC? But it turns out that a lot of the stuff is already kind of there on those platforms, it just seems that this is a slightly better version, maybe, than the original. It really doesn't seem that great, but yeah, it's it's just Red Dead Redemption 1. Most of it, which you can play on the PS4 or the Switch, mm -hmm. and it costs $50, which is like almost as much as a brand new game. Yeah. Um, uh. One of the gripes was... You can still get it on the Xbox Store for thirty dollars, mm -hmm. and then get all the DLC for thirteen, which still only ends up being forty-three dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Keep in mind, this game is like over thirteen years old. Yeah. So I'd There's say that even too. thirty dollars for a thirteen-year-old game—that's that's held its price quite mm -hmm. high. But then being like, well. You could get a game that was made this year for, like, $10 more? Is it $60 for games over in America now? AAA games? Um, it's It's been up to 70 now. Up to 70 that's, okay. That's the standard, standardized price. Okay, so it'd be $20 um, more for a brand new game. Yeah, Take-Two take CEO doesn't know jack <laughs> <laughs> about 
what what players should be given based on the price point something more than just a port because that's that's unnecessary i mean you can even use freaking skyrim as an example like Mm -hmm. each time there was a re-release there was always something else added or something improved yeah like it you could get mad at Todd for re-releasing Skyrim, but there was always something different every time it happened. Yep. <laughs> Made the game at least somewhat better or different. This is this is nonsense. Also, it's uh, not available on PC, like, at all. Which, just a bit weird. I don't get why. It's just console. <laughs> you can emulate the game on PC, but there's no, like, official right. release on PC. Okay, which yeah. Which is... It's it's just odd. Don't know what Take Two and Rockstar are up to with this. Like, mm-hmm. it's it's weird, man. I don't get it. Yeah. But you know what? They're not the only team who are overpricing things. <laughs> oh no, Sarge! This is one of your favorite <laughs> things, though. It's fine because all the bad stuff lines up well. So Total War Warhammer Three. A game that I love, it's great, lots and lots of fun, has recently announced the Shadows of Change DLC, bringing a few legendary lords, and some extra units, some heroes, some cool campaign mechanics, just like lots of very cool stuff. The Changeling in particular looks incredible, plays differently to like anyone else, can literally transform into other legendary lords, which is just awesome. Changeling looks amazing. The other two legendary characters are Yuanbo and Mother Ostenka, I think it is. can't really remember. I'm, I'm clearly not paying much attention to those two. The <laughs> other two seem decent and give much needed boosts and stuff to their factions. But the Zinchi and one of the Changeling is what seems really, really cool. And yeah, a few extra lords, some heroes and stuff with it, some units. Kind of a standard lord pack, to be fair. Do you know how much it costs, Kato? No idea. Have a guess at the price for a DLC with three, like, playable characters in it. Keep in mind there's, like, a lot of playable characters you have in the game, and a lot more will be coming. This isn't, like, a one-off thing. This is just the standard, small, standard DLC thing. I don't know. 20 bucks? That's... See... People probably would have said, oh, 20 bucks is a bit much. But it's $25. Hmm. $25 for these free lords. And people are not happy. Like, at all. Like, really, really not happy, honestly. I think there was also, yeah, a Total War DLC statement. And they point out their costs are up and stuff. So there's an increase in the price. But people were not happy with this. Because they were just being like, hey, uh, we've we've also fixed some stuff. We've, we've made new content. It costs more. It was very much just a, yeah, we get that. It's very standard. But we're still not happy with the price. Because it's a lot. Mm-hmm. The price is a lot, and people just aren't really happy about it. Because it seems like a cool DLC, but not a $25 DLC. That's almost half a full game for just a few characters. Yeah. That's uh, a lot. Seeing somewhere that, like, in comparison to previous two... Mm-hmm. It's like twice like it as costs, much. It costs more, but it's also less content? Is that right? Uh... It depends on the DLCs, like, some of them had, like, multiple lords, like, four or so lords for faction DLCs, and I think they were about half the price of this, but Mm. then the ones that only had a couple were probably a little under half the price of this, I feel like maybe a eight or nine quid, so, yeah, like, it's it's clearly a lot more expensive for what you're getting. Like, this is more than a Lord Pack would normally give you by, like, it's 50% more than what a Lord Pack would normally give you for about two and a half times the price, which, you know, doesn't work out. Even with costs going up and stuff, it's a bit much. 
Like, I, mm. I personally was thinking, okay, if it's 15 quid or less, I'll consider it. it, it it's not. Plus, it releases on August 31st. <laughs> a day before, like, early access Starfield happens. Day before so, um, everything happens. Yeah. So, I'm just not going to play it. I'll have uninstalled Total War Warhammer <laughs> 3 by that point. Uh-huh. I think I'm, I'm due to play the game on the 27th probably means like 28th or 29th but i'll just uninstall the game because then star falls right around the corner i'll be uninstalling a lot of games just won't need it yeah just for the sake of like footage space and stuff yeah footage space and just making sure everything runs smoothly and mm. it may as well you know yeah this is a shame because the dlc seems kind of cool the like content creators who are part of the partner program and stuff already have access to it and I'm watching some of their videos and enjoying it vicariously that way but it's not one I'll be getting myself like maybe in the future if it goes on sale for like 80% off or something then yeah I'll pick it up but that won't be for a few years it's just mm -hmm. way too expensive <laughs> well I would like to mention a little bright spot when it comes to you know, games and things coming out that have already existed for a while. Um, QuakeCon happened and they also announced a enhanced version of Quake 2 mm. uh, around August 10th. I just looked, just checked really quick and it looks to be you already own Quake 2, the, the original, um, just a free update. Nice. That was very cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I mean, all the new features and improvements that it says. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, we've added in a bunch of accessibility features and stuff, but I'm guessing that's what you're about to hit on. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> new features and improvements. This includes the original Quake 2 campaign, plus both mission packs, the Reckoning, Ground Zero, plus the previously Nintendo 64 exclusive Quake 2 64, and the brand new Call the Machine episode for Machine Games. Hey, that's a name we know. Um, improvements to gameplay, including content restored from the original development, plus visual upgrades sh such as dynamic shadows, improved lighting, glow maps, and more. Uh, you can play local split screen and online across four multiplayer modes with cross-play functionality, cooperative deathmatch, team deathmatch, capture the flag, and you can add AI opponents in deathmatch and team deathmatch modes. Uh, explore the id vault enjoy improved co-op play and much more those were just the little highlight section there's quite a bit actually listed here um go down to accessibility features after installing and updating the game for the first time you'll be presented with an Excel accessibility options notification high contrast alternate typeface uh transcribe voice chat Ooh, that's that's cool let's see screen flash amount meter chat message time a lot of uh text-based accessibility stuff as well um i'm sure there's more to it but like this this is cool um it's nice to see um also a classic legendary shooter of a franchise to be um thought of i mean they still have a convention named after quake so i mean yeah it feels weird that quake could still a thing it makes some sense that that would that that would be something that happens but like it's it's nice that it's free if you have the game yeah. um and it looks like quake 2 i feel like it was on sale during quake con but it might have gone back up in price um but it's still probably not super expensive uh normal price is 10 bucks um so i imagine like if you just wait for like the winter sale or whatever it'll drop back down to like three or two um, or be bundled with like all the Quake games so if you're interested there it is there's there's our little positive uh, after all of the <laughs> all of the other news that we talked about oh man I can't believe you put a positive news story in here Kato oh I'm so sorry sorry dare you I feel terrible about that <laughs> but I'm gonna feel I'm gonna feel terrible about mechs in particular when we hit our topic. Uh, that's a little tease. So oh, I, I mean, are we about to hit the topic? We've yeah, we've made it to the topic. I was 
I don't know why I was acting as <laughs> though it's a ways away. For the next sentence. Oh, uh, yes, for the next thing, the, the immediate next thing. Hit that timestamp, it's like a second away. So there was an interview on Discord with Will Shen and Emil Pagliolo. <laughs> Will Shen is the lead quest designer of Starfield and Emil is the lead designer of Starfield. They did a little Q&A, like 15 something odd questions. I think um, 16 entire questions. 16? Oh yeah, my god, they that's a one more. One. The bonus that's... one was about mechs as well. God dang it. <laughs> All right. Why don't we why don't we just jump in, Sarge? Could All you right. Okay. So on this one we've got the question, can we buy houses or property in main cities? Um, Will saying, yep, there's housing in different cities that the player can get, some you have to purchase, and some are rewards for specific quests. And Emil saying, sure can, you can purchase a dwelling in all the major cities in the game, and there's at least one that you get specifically for completing something. Hmm. It's gonna be homes. Is it a mech house? No. Stop about the mechs, Kato. Is it Not a house mechs. made out of a hollowed out mech? <sighs> I can dream. No, I I, I forbid it. <laughs> no dreams allowed. No dreams allowed. Uh, I mean, so this is pretty standard. I think it is. Imagine it's a Bethesda staple at this point. I will um, say a reasonable number of the questions were just like, "Hey, here's a really basic thing that anyone who plays your previous games would expect. It gonna happen?" Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's why people were asking about the mechs, because you know. My same Mets comparison. Aren't normal things, though. That's a different. Yeah, one that I but appreciate. the but the power armor, the power armor power can be the mech. To mechs, it like can quite be significantly the same. different. It can be a, but... a significant difference. They already stretched out the player's skeleton. Stretch it out <laughs> more for a mech. God, oh. I want I want to look like Gumby by the time we're we're done playing. Okay, I'll do the next question then. Okay, uh, I'm gonna Google Gumby. <laughs> question if we get the kid stuff traits will our parents be generated based on our characters look are or are their standard parents put in place and what benefits might there be gifts from mom and dad quests etc etc et uh will says our programmers on our new face tech were excited to make a function where you could try to match your custom face and then create the two parents so they are based on what your character looks like, although the specific math involved is a bit beyond me. Uh, we had similar tech in our previous games. Hey, kind of like Fallout 4. Weird. Uh, Emil says, yes, totally, just as we did in Fallout 3 with your dad and Fallout 4 with your son. In Starfield, if you take the kid stuff trait, your parents are based off of you. No spoilers, but I think trans will really appreciate the actors we got to play those roles. And they just get so into it. It's awesome. Appreciate the uh, love for the voice actors there. Yeah. Probably needing a lot of it now. For sure. Um, yeah, this is once again what we saw in Fallout 3 and Fallout 4. Not too surprising that they're doing the same sort of thing. But it's it's cool to see. And we'll make it yeah. so that your parents actually look kind of like you. Which is going to be like helpful rather than just having people who look nothing like your character and being like, Oh, what's going on here? Yeah. But yeah. And it's it's a cool it. kind of reverse scenario kind of thing too that they Yeah. I don't really think they have really done. I mean before. Fallout 3 was the one where it kind of happened. Fallout 3 you you still modeled your adult face. Yeah. Though I don't know. No, I guess I guess it's an adult regardless, so whatever. Never mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. No. Also the Gumby thing I'm confused by. <laughs> I just sent Kato a photo of Gumby, which is a Monty Python thing. And I feel like it can't what? be that. It's probably not that. <laughs> okay. No. No, no, no. Cool. <laughs> this is Gumby. Cool. It's completely different. Oh, Gumby's apparently like a little... What would I describe that as? Plasticine figure? Yes. Like a bluey-green plasticine figure. <laughs> not a guy with, like, glasses who screams and smacks people on the head. They're very different. Exact yeah, same name. quite different. <laughs> Alright. Well, that little tangent aside. Yep, yep. Next question, and a bit of a more involved one this time. 
For those of us who have never played a Bethesda Game Studio game, and will be starting with Starfield, what information should we know that will make the experience more impactful right from the start? And to add to that, how deep should we go into creating our character's backstory before we start the game? Should we have our character's backstory fleshed out like in a D&D campaign, or will that come as we play? Namil says, We always make our games for fans both old and new, so you can jump in without ever having played a Bethesda title before. But we like to look at it less as playing a game, and more about living in the universe we created. So settle in, go at your own pace, and pretty soon you'll learn all the systems and be adventuring through the settled systems the way you choose. As for going into a character's backstory, that's entirely up to you. I'm all about their headcanon. For example, my latest character is a working schlub named Mitch Dombrowski. Maybe. He's a husky, good-natured space trucker, and while he'll do whatever he needs to defend himself, he'll never shoot first. He's like Han Solo's sweeter older brother. And yes, there are traits and background that support that kind of thing. And Will says, while we do start you off in the same spot, uh -huh, what happened to you before the game starts is totally up to you and your headcanon. There is a trait and background system that will let you specify more about yourself, but you can also select an anonymous background and no traits if you want. In terms of if you've never played a BGS game before, try anything. We're a simulation as well as a role-playing game, so we try to support the player doing what they want as much as we can. Ooh! Yeah. They said the word simulation. Simulation. <laughs> Excellent. So, it, you made a noise when made they mentioned when talking. they mentioned starting starting in this from the same place. Yes. Which I think should be totally expected, but I've already seen tons of people talking about how it will be like the alternate start mod. For mm. no particular reason. Because people are dumb. I hate people. <laughs> God. They just stop. Um, That's yeah, why we I, need I to make videos. Just, I think it's just good to get this basic stuff also confirmed. Cause God, people are dumb. I'm trying not yeah, to just well, say that, but it's all okay. going from my brain. Well... Part of the comparison is there's going to be comparisons made to more recent open world games and whether I like it or not, some of those comparisons will be made with Cyberpunk, who, which had the three life paths and different starts on those life paths, unfortunately. I mean, different starts for the tutorial. <laughs> so different really starts for the tutorial, to. which bits and pieces of the tutorial were just kind of missing depending on <laughs> where you decided to go so i personally i'm i'm speaking with a, a an appreciation for how bethesda does it is uh allowing you to kind of start in the same place but having your background be you know changeable and be talked about um so that allows you to get the whole tutorial experience um hopefully not missing some crucial info like where the e-brake is on your car mm. anyway <laughs> your space car that is yeah. i'm just definitely talking about starfield still space car yeah i mean your mech anyway how will smuggling cargo system how will the smuggling cargo system work can we hide it somewhere on the ship and sell it for more currency later will says certain items are considered contraband and you'll need to smuggle them past security ships that are in orbit of major settlements. You'll need specific modules on your ship to hide from security scans. Certain items are considered contraband, and you'll need to smuggle them past security ships uh, that are in organ. Okay, that looks like a double copy of the same info. Um, Emil said uh, there are specific items that are considered contraband, meaning they, they're pretty much illegal everywhere. And yes, you can hide them using special ship modules you can purchase. So, you know, don't get caught with those harvested organs. The economy is fixed, but prices of bought and sold goods can change based on the skills you choose. Yeah, so that's much like we've seen before. The fixed economy is a bit of a shame. I would have liked to see a tiny bit of fluctuation added in in the future, but not really a big deal. Very much to be expected. But hey, yeah. smuggling stuff is cool. Yeah, it is. I like that being added in. I, I'm wondering if, if it's... Uh, if it may be adjustable or may adjust in the sense of like only certain people will buy certain things like I don't know organs 
Yeah, that could still come under the fixed thing because like um, Skyrim had that with like blacksmiths only buy like weapons, armor, materials. Yeah, wizards unless, buy like, scrolls and books. Unless your your speech speechcraft or whatever got incredibly high and you got the perk for speech you know, fifty with merchant, which selling free skill points and method. selling to everyone because then because then you're the wheeler dealer yeah. that's trying to offload all their junk. Yep. Um. Yeah. But I mean, uh, they mentioned perks as well, skills as well. You choose changing prices and stuff. Could be other effects in there. We don't know that for certain. Yeah. Um. But... I have I have had my myself spoiled by a little game called Kenchi. Oh. Because <laughs> smuggling in that game is a heck of a lot of fun. You don't even go off world. You're on the same planet the whole time, but you're <laughs> you're smuggling hashish to the United Cities. And if they catch you with contraband, you're you're off to the frickin' mining camp. <laughs> well, how about we talk about what happens when you get arrested in Starfield? Because the next Ooh. question is, will there be a jail system like in Skyrim if Top we've five committed jails. a crime? <laughs> Wilshen says, yes, you can elect to go to jail or pay a fine when you're arrested, or even resist arrest and try to escape. And Emil says, yep. The settled system is more like Skyrim than Fallout 4's Commonwealth in that regard. You bunch of criminals. There's civilization, there's government, and there are laws. And in a couple of cases, we actually explore the themes of crime and punishment in our futuristic universe. Final sentence there is interesting. Hopefully some actual yeah. crime quests being in. Um, so far, though, sounds very similar to like the standard pay fine, go jail thing that you, you yeah it sounds similar to like what you get in Skyrim which I always thought wasn't a great system like it's yeah. not terrible but it became very repetitive I will mm -hmm. be curious if the options have been like balanced a bit more because it was kind of a thing that like you join the Thieves Guild you almost always just pay the fine because it's next to nothing yeah or you just quick load if not like going to jail like he could break out and it was fun to do like once or twice and for thematic playthroughs it was good but hopefully they make it a bit more interesting or better for happening more than once but yeah there, there will be punishment to your crimes I, I would like there to be like since there is going to be a lot of exploration based stuff in Starfield mm -hmm. like maybe grounding your ship and legitimately um, having you either stay on world and do like community service <laughs> to be able to like get back on your ship and, and fly to other worlds and stuff like that. Or on the other hand, um, your ship is grounded. You have no control over where you go. And instead you could be radiantly transported somewhere else to do the work. And then once you succeed with maybe limited resources, you can then come back and be able to fly your ship. That's just me hoping for something that may not be in the game, but I think that would be cool. Would actual be cool. actual consequence kind of system instead of just like, here's some money. Yeah. No, I hope the other it way. is just a bit more expanded. Because it sounds like we're not getting anything too drastic, but if they've just balanced it a little bit better, it will be nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or like if you get caught smuggling, the guards could be like, what if we skimmed a little off the top? Yeah. <laughs> It's like if you're if you're smuggling, you know, neon drugfish. You know what? The voice lines on that as well, I think, will really change it. Because mm -hmm. if they've actually made a wide variety rather than stop or halt thief and stop their criminal <laughs> scum, like if we get more than like one or two voice lines that we hear over and over, <laughs> that'll make it a lot less annoying. I I mean, there's how many lines of dialogue recorded for this game this is way more than like 100 gazillion Skyrim and Fallout 4 combined or something like that yeah it's lots more giving it a quick google so I would I would hope the guards yeah. would get more it's over 250,000 lines of dialogue Skyrim apparently was 60,000 and Fallout 4 was 111,000 yeah. so like yeah more than double what Fallout 4 had 
So oh, oh, let's, uh, there's a let's Reddit hope. post saying Starfield now has exactly 252,953 lines of dialogue, which I'm not sure if uh, I believe them. According to who? According to some random person on Reddit last year. Ah. <laughs> Thank you, anonymous <laughs> Redditor. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's fine. Why, why wouldn't anyone believe them? Yep. I mean, spoilers. Don't spoil the game. But I mean, that also was a year ago. So that's I would be, not a I would be counting each line. Ah, <laughs> uh, the amount of lines. I'm gonna have to start over now. Yep. Yeah. Lots of dialogue, though. Hopefully, means some of the more repeatable lines aren't gonna be used constantly. But uh, next, 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 <laughs> next. I've decided you... we're moving on. <laughs> Can you be a double agent in the game? Like, for example... You missed one. What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> will time pass when not in the game? For example, will my trade routes, outposts, and mining operations continue to produce, or does anything occur... Or does that only occur while actively playing? And Will says, only when actively playing. And Mill says, the simulation only runs when you're actually playing. No sleeping on the job! Wow, so sorry. they're just telling us to no life it, is what they're saying. Uh, um, there's but I'm, two I'm ways sh to kind of interpret this. I, I know that there's like a weight system in the game too, like, it, like I'm guessing we didn't see it obviously in the promotional content, but I'm sure it's a thing. Um, and also traveling from place to place uh, through space is probably going to take time as well, or yeah, past what, time. What I'm wondering with their answers is like, are they answering? Do I have to be? in the game for stuff to be happening or do I have to be not waiting for stuff to happening I think they're I think the question is related to to a real time clock yeah and that's never really been a thing in open world Bethesda games but then the answer being it's only when you're actively playing makes it seem like you can't just wait or sleep for things to progress that makes it seem like it is real time. I feel like this was just not a well-worded question, honestly. That's right. I'm insulting whoever made that question. Because I... will time pass when not in the game is not a good question, in my opinion. I think it's pretty straightforward. I don't! There's too many ways to interpret that, and this well... is not super clear. Well, how would it better be worded? Would time pass if the game's not on? <laughs> Does time exist? <laughs> no, I, I'd is, have worded something how is like... time? Oh, it's raining. Yay. Um, nice. I'd have worded something like, in the game, are you able to wait and sleep, and will this progress things other than just the time slash date? That's probably the way I'd have gone with a quick wording. Although if I was submitting a question to the q and I'd probably look over it a bit more before submitting. But I feel like that's a better one for getting the option. Because this just kind of reads to me as well, like, oh, you have to play the game, like, when the game is turned off, nothing's going to be happening, is, like, a fair way to read this. But another way is that sleeping and waiting won't change things. Like, it's not clear enough. I, I don't... I think it is. <laughs> I think it's but clear I've enough. But I told you multiple interpretations. Which one <laughs> has to be definitively right? Time will not pass when the game's not on. Is, is but that's a dumb question to ask then, because obviously that's the case. <laughs> well, some people have played games like I don't know, Animal Crossing, where time yeah. does pass in the game when you're not playing it. That's... And it's not on. This is this is what that question is kind of referring to. So it was easy for my mind to connect to something because I had a but point of reference. That seems like the less likely thing for it to be asking for me. That that's that's what it's asking though. But see, I'm not certain on that. I still think it could be the question asking, like, hey, can I just kind of spam the sleeping function to make things go faster? Like, I'm not certain that it's either one. To sleep in the game, you need to be in the game, though. And the question specifically says at the beginning, will time pass when not in the game? Yeah, that's what it says at the start, but then all the other references are while actively playing. 
and the actively word is throwing things off there because you can passively just do things and like it could be clearer is what i'm saying <laughs> like i can't say for certain that you're right you might be i'm not saying you're wrong i'm just saying that this is not clear enough and i this hate is... everyone because human language sucks is this is this the hill sarge dies on during this episode <laughs> i'm just gonna build so many hills and i'm gonna put a little bit i'm just gonna chop off little bits of my body so i can die on all of them <laughs> I don't know. Tell us in the comments. Let's make a poll. <laughs> <laughs> Does this question make sense to you? I mean, it, it makes sense. I don't sense. even play Animal Crossing. The, the problem is it makes sense, but the way you read it first is like, yep, that's the way it means. Yeah. But people won't... I, just, I hate everything. Question. Okay. Can you be a double agent in the game? <laughs> <laughs> just moving on. <laughs> this it's question's fine. worded fine, so I'm happy with it. <laughs> like, for example, you join the United Colonies, can you also join the Crimson Fleet and give the United Colonies information or something like that? And what factions have that feature if they do? And Will says, all of the playable factions can be completed independently. The Crimson Fleet storyline does feature you being an undercover agent inside the fleet on behalf of UC System Defense, a specific military branch of the United Colonies. But whether you betray the fleet or use the system defense is a choice you will get to make. Emil says, Ha! That is exactly what you can do. Infiltrate the Crimson Fleet for UC Sys defense. Uh, it's specific to that quest line. In the studio, I have been, half jokingly, accused of referencing movies that some folks have never seen because I'm old. So, with this particular plotline, the inspiration was very much the movie Donny Brasco, which is the true story of an FBI agent who infiltrates the Mafia. How far will you go? Now, I don't really want to spoil anything, so all I'll say is you have specific roles slash jobs slash missions in the faction quest lines. The Freestyle Collective and United Colonies are giant organisations, and the work you do for them is important, but it's not like you gain complete control of those factions at the end of those quest lines. Yay! As for whether or not the UC will be violently angry with you if you ultimately take the Crimson Fleet side, yeah, they ain't happy. Lol. This, I think, very good question. Very good answers. Yeah, great answers, actually, yeah. because we got we got one of those confirmations of things where I, I like to, you know, have confirmation that I, I'm not going to be the leader of a faction by the time I hit the end of the quests. Because sometimes yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> I feel like both Starfall and Fallout 4 got quite heavily criticized for that. Uh, Skyrim? And Fallout 4? S yep, Skyrim and Fallout 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brain's not great. <laughs> That's okay, um, Sarge. <laughs> yeah, so it's good that Starfield's just not being like, hey, you're gonna be in charge. I also, not like 100% confirmed, but it sounds like the Constellation storyline's probably gonna be like the main, main quest, so to speak. Oh yeah, yeah. And therefore, and it's not like tied into factions in the same way as like Fallout 4 was. It sounds more Skyrim-like, where the factions are like the side things you go through, and maybe there'll be a bit of touching on them as you go yeah. through. Yeah, like they, the main, like, civilization, or the main colony factions are, yeah, they just, they just kind of exist, and you can decide to join in or not. Yeah. Um, also, Donnie Brasco, I feel like that's a pretty popular movie. I'm the youngest person here, and I've seen it. It's a good film. Yeah, you watch weird movies, though. That is fair. <laughs> <laughs> I watched a bunch of Marvel movies recently. That's like as mainstream as it gets. That's true. I I did watch uh, the the Ant Man films to be to get caught up. Yeah, I watched Quantumania, and apparently some people quite liked it. I thought it was kind of fun. I mean, it was, it was... I, I'm in the minority here. I know this because yeah, I I tweeted. We're going on a small tangent. Sorry, everyone. All right. Watched Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantumania and Guardians of the Galaxy three back to back and feel they couldn't be more different. Quantumania felt like it was everything people talk about when they say Marvel movies suck, and Guardians of the Galaxy three was everything good about them. And huh. Yeah, Tifa's just saying like she's not watching it because that stuff is sad in movies and she doesn't want to experience yeah that. well yeah there's there's <laughs> sadness in spades Which, in, in one of them yeah uh, I can't but, get. but also like I'm I was kind of mad on both honestly oh, what yeah okay. 
I've got Colonel Damders here, a YouTuber who I've spoken to before. Says I watched Quantumania recently and for honestly thought it was just fine. Not amazing, but enjoyable enough. And Eric says Quantumania is a fun and sci-fi movie. <laughs> it's weird <laughs> he's used sci-fi as a descriptive there, but I... <laughs> just strange sensing. Uh, it's all I needed. G O T G three is in my top five MCU films, and says Four Love and Thunder was my major letdown. And see, I thought Four Love and Thunder was fine. It's definitely not one of my favourites. It's kind of mid on there. But Guardians of the Galaxy 3 was by far one of the best I've seen. And Quantumania, I'd probably say, was one of the worst. I found it really, really dull. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. just I, I found it interesting how, like, for the most part, people either thought, oh, it's okay, or good. Like, I seem to be the only negative opinion I've seen on it. Which I'm I wonder, fine with, to be clear. I wonder if, if, I mean, that's based on a lot of factors. I'm sure at this point, like, hmm. like it could be, it could be Marvel fatigue for some people. It could be, yeah. like, they they have their favorite Marvel movie, and it, and it could be something they saw upwards of ten years ago now, and they're remembering yeah. it through their rose colored glasses, and that's yeah. their point of comparison. <laughs> then they go back and then they look at it. And they're like, oh yeah, it's actually not, not what I thought. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> or my tastes have changed and stuff like that. It could be a lot of like different things, um, but yeah, I I may I may be on the downturn of like having too much Marvel fatigue and also playing really really good Marvel games and just okay. wanting to go back and play those. Because <laughs> um, like I watched the uh, uh, Doctor Strange, uh, what's, the, what's the of madness? multiverse of madness, and yeah. like that just made me want to play Midnight Suns. Like, because that was by far a better Wanda story than probably any of the. Like, I didn't see WandaVision, but. You don't watch WandaVision? I didn't. Oh, it's I don't... good. Is it? It's, it's way better than Multiverse of Madness. WandaVision's good. Multiverse of Madness, I'd say, is fine to poor. I found it a little disappointing, but I feel like it was more like it could have been a lot better as opposed to it actually being bad. Okay. My opinion of the movie. But yeah, WandaVision's good. It's quite interesting. That and Loki are the two Marvel series I'd recommend people watch. Loki the too, others. huh? Yeah. Loki's fun. Huh. It's okay. it's quite light hearted, but with its darker moments, which I very much appreciate. And season two's coming towards the end of the year. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll think about it. Uh, then again, Starfield's coming out soon, so... It is, yeah. I happen to be <laughs> dog-sitting, so have access to Disney+, Plus. so I caught up on Marvel recently. And Hence at, this like, tangent. I've, I've had the means to, like, sit in my chair and just play a game, too, and it turns out that game is way bigger than I thought it was going to be, so... Oh, dear. <laughs> you know... Um, yeah, so, but the joining factions thing and having the option, I'm, I feel like it's going to be, like, the intro tour thing and then you're going to be able to be free to do, like, whatever. Yeah. Because I, I think they'd mentioned that before. Um, anyway, next question. Uh, depending on the traits selected during the character creation, will it be, will it all be possible to play through the game in a pacifist mode, i.e. without killing anyone or even potentially anything? Um... Will Shen said, I can't guarantee every mission can be completed in pacifist mode, but we do have a couple of systems that will help. One is our speech challenge game, where you can persuade someone to do something like not fight you. Those are specific scripted moments, and we try to add into most quests where important characters confront you. The other is a weapon type that can knock enemies unconscious. Ah. Emil said... So we talked about this very early during pre-production, whether or not we would be able to fully support a non-lethal playthrough. We realized that w for various reasons, it's not totally feasible. Now that that being said, there are some good non-lethal options, whether through dialogue by using a non-lethal weapon. Uh, those can be used in certain situations, honestly a lot of situations, though I couldn't comfortably say that you can complete the entire game without killing whatsoever. Challenge accepted for someone, I'm sure. Oh, no, um, okay. The, yeah. <laughs> the settled systems is mostly civilized, but it can be a dangerous place if you're off the beaten path, and you're going to certainly be going off the off the beaten path. So I'm gonna guess, um, non-lethal weapon is made for humans. Um, that's that's my guess. Using it on like big alien life that'll rip you to shreds, I'm guessing probably won't work. 
as well or at all. I mean, I was thinking um, more just for life forms in general, and then it wouldn't work on like robots or synthetic things, stuff like that. Hmm. But maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's good to see there's at least been consideration made towards non-lethal. Yeah. And they're also not saying like, oh, you definitely cannot play non-lethally. But it sounds like most of the stuff you'll be going through, the standard option is kill stuff, and there'll no doubt be missions where you have to kill things, do yeah. stuff like that. And but, and I mean, it's <laughs> it's a I don't know if it's a fair comparison or not at this point because we haven't gotten our hands on Starfield yet. But the whole non-lethal thing in Cyberpunk was wasted. Um, it exists, but it's it barely it, matters. I'm trying to think of this. There was a mission with monks where I think if you didn't kill anyone, the guy said thank you. That's it. <laughs> yep, that's literally the only <laughs> change on Lethal made. He lambasts you if you kill all of the, the Maelstrom gang that kidnapped him and augmented him against his will. Yeah. He's, he's, still, he's still all about the peace. We're just like, you're full of metal now, man. Come on. That's, that's literally the only example I can think of. Yeah, the... Um, so, yeah. The Cyber Psycho sightings, uh, you get a better reward from, um, what's her name, if if yeah. you knock them out. Uh, oh, that's but that's cool. that's pretty much it. Like, yeah. there wasn't much beyond that, and it was very disappointing. For yeah, like... I feel like honestly, Obsidian is the only developer I know who tends to non-lethal well. Like we've seen or it like in the pacifism. Outworlds. Yeah. Yeah. Seen it in the yeah. Outer Worlds, saw it in New Vegas. And while both had their issues, that's, I guess that's kind of the gold standard. Yeah. Kind of. I, I'm guessing the, the lack of feasibility thing is is the procedural like planet systems, too. It's like you don't know what kind of uh, fauna you're going to run into, what kind of... <laughs> you know, hostiles are going to show up. Generally, you're probably going to have to fight at some point. Yeah. Um, just on sheer, like, randomization basis. So... Yeah. I'm sure there will be people, like, immediately upon picking up the game, though, trying to do pacifist runs. Oh, for sure. Like, it's the <laughs> sort of thing I'd like to do a challenge run for, but it's so mainstream that other people will beat me to it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Still... And Evans. the speedrunners will just be like, nope, this is a pacifist playthrough too, and just, like, clip through the wall <laughs> and beat the game. Yep, pacifist playthrough. <laughs> Open console. Complete game, please. Enter. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Alright. On to the next part. Next question is, what are the beliefs and basic history of the religions we can join? Sanctum Universum, Enlightened Great Serpent. Emil says, okay, so this one. Existing IRL religions are part of a Starfall universe, with folks of all religions and denominations out there. But we don't really focus on them. Instead, we highlight three new ones specific to the game. Sanctum Universum, the members called Universals, believe that God very much exists somewhere in the universe, that a higher power is guiding us all. Specifically, they believe that humanity's ability to travel the universe and grab jump is God's way of saying, I'm out here, come find me. The Enlightened, these folks are essentially organised atheists. They don't believe in any kind of higher power. Rather, they teach that human beings have to take care of each other, and they practice what they preach through various community outreach programmes. And then there is House Varun. Oh boy. So in the game, you're not really sure what the complete truth is, but the gossip among the guards is this. A colony ship sets off for a new world, making grab jumps along the way. After one of the grav jumps, one of the passengers claims he spent that time communing with a celestial entity known as the Great Serpent. What was a few seconds for everyone else was much longer for him, and he brought back a mandate, which is basically, get on board or be devoured when the Great Serpent encircles the universe. Is it true? I ain't saying. In the game, you sometimes face off against House Varun Zealots as an enemy group, and that's their motivation. I recently got the House Varun logo tattooed on my wrist, so yeah, I dig them. Oh. And we also have uh, Will saying Sanctum Universum, the members called Universals, believe that God very much exists somewhere in the uh, universe. There's a higher power, is guiding us all. Specifically, they believe that humanity's ability to travel the universe and grab jump is God's way of saying, I'm out here, come find me. 
Wait, did I read that one? Yes. I did. Will's ones. <laughs> the ones <laughs> I didn't read. Who says, The Sanctum Universum is only a couple of decades old in our timeline, but has gained a lot of prominence. They believe that God is out there, somewhere in the universe, and that humanity's ability to travel the stars brings us closer to God. Then, the Enlightened are an atheist group that focuses on humanitarian and community work. They believe that life is something every person has to take responsibility for, so that if we want the world to be a better place, we have to do it. There we go. Those were yeah. Will's bits as well. Um, so this is cool. Um, Emil got a tattoo of the the Great Serpent worshippers. Um, yeah. It sounds like they may be a prominent faction just kind of based on that. <laughs> I mean they sound very cool and they're clearly like your standard raider faction but also a bit more to them from what we've seen mm -hmm. like we already saw in the direct like uh, recite a passage to get by them peacefully yeah so and there, there's almost certainly going to be quests and stuff with them it, it feels like they're they're more like 70 slash, 76 slash nuclear world style of raider type enemies as opposed to the old school. It's a bandit. Y you kill it. Yeah. Which is I'm good. I'm bored with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um I I'm I'm hoping there's there's some of those big moments where like um is it true? I don't know when they're talking about the the big serpent and stuff like that. Like I'm hoping yeah. there is like movement in celestial bodies that is so big it's hard to comprehend. Um <laughs> like or even even on on uh, when you're on world somewhere, uh, like just something big, like beyond massive, is moving around. Yeah. Um, because like those are some of the coolest moments in video games that you kind of like don't forget. Um, like when you first see the world serpent, um, in God of War. Mm -hmm. Like that's just like oh. Oh, it exists. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about it. It just exists. <laughs> it could crush you with a less than a tooth. Like, it's yeah. massive. I'd love um, for there to be a giant psychic snake just in space. Yep, That'd be space cool. snake. Yep. Yeah. Especially because yep. it kind of blurs the line between the more religious, you have to believe in something which isn't there for you to touch versus oh this is actually here but if it's a real thing is it like a worshipful thing in the same way I think it's an interesting kind of dynamic you can go into with religion in games and movies and stuff without actually like pissing off too many people is the only thing yeah. I can think of saying it yeah and they're they're yeah they're making their own kind of yeah. um, religions and building the world out from from those as well uh i i think uh it's going to be a cool bit of extra context if you decide to choose one of these three as one of your backgrounds yep um or traits traits mm -hmm. yeah yep. um because the great server one was particularly entertaining because you have to jump all the time <laughs> to keep the buff um i think it's the great serpent one i don't recall this yeah. Did, did uh, you, are you sure you didn't have a fever dream? <laughs> let me look it up. It wasn't the mouse situation, Sarge. <laughs> I actually wrote it not long ago. <laughs> Transcribed it, actually. Serpent's Embrace. Uh, you grew up worship worshipping the Great Serpent. Grav jumping provides a temporary boost to health and endurance, but health and endurance are lowered if you don't continue jumping regularly. Like an addiction. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. So... You get it's a grab jumping. That's yeah. you get temporary health every time you jump. All right, I, I think it's that's, funny. That is quite funny. I mean, especially <laughs> in the way you described it. That's which sounds like you just have to buddy hop. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's what it seems like. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay, I should read this, right? Yep. When we assign crew members to work at outposts, you do we have to pay them? How are you missing them? How am I missing them? Okay, how can, how many <laughs> companions total will we be able to recruit? Will says, there are over 20 named characters who can join your crew. Four of them are from Constellation and have the most story and interaction with the player. 
but all the named characters have their own backgrounds and can follow you around. They'll stay at your side like our previous games and carry your stuff. Um, Emil says over 20 total and we really focused on the members of Constellation. Uh, when we first began Starfield pre-production, we looked back at our previous games and realized how popular and effective the companions were. So they were a big priority for us and we wanted to tie them directly to the main quest. There are some really big moments with them specifically. Um, I should also mention that our companion voice cast is amazing. Once again, shouting out the voice cast. Awesome. <laughs> we haven't released the list yet, but you can be sure that there are a lot of talented actors bringing those characters to life. Oh, in addition to companions, you can also hire generic crew members to work at your outpost or on your ship. Very happy about the generic crew members as well. Means you can dedicate the named characters to like more specific roles rather than being like, oh, I need someone to man this basic post. Here yes. you go, legendary space outlaw. I guess this is what you're doing now. Yeah. It's like just having settlers at your settlement as opposed yeah. to companions, but on a way bigger scale. Yep. I am curious as well, like, how much background and stuff we have for the 16 plus, like, non constellation companions. Because mm -hmm. the constellation ones, obviously, they're gonna have, like, well, I imagine there'll be, like, quest lines and stuff that you get on with them, and you get a lot of information, a lot of story. They're, they're tied into the main story, after all. There's a lot going on with them. But I am curious what level we'll get with the others. Is it going to be like in Skyrim with mercenaries and other followers who just get like a few lines about where they came from and some generic kind of dialogue for them? Or is it going to be a bit more advanced than that? Like, I'm, I'm curious how much we'll really get. Because they do talk about companions being a big priority, but they also yeah. make sure to point out that the constellation ones are the main ones. Yeah. So. I'm I'm curious how interesting the non main companions will be. I'm wondering if they have have like an like a starting quest for them to show up or something like that. Or like you just run across them at like New Atlantis or whatever. Yeah. And uh, they're I like I feel like there might be a bit of a mix. They're like, Hey, I got caught smuggling and now I'm grounded. Can I come with you? Yeah. Well we and saw then, in the direct, like you know. There was the one guy just stuck on an astronaut, which feels like a kind of you go and uncover. But there was yeah. also the adoring fan, who might count as a companion. Yes. Uh, well, like... yeah, he yeah he would count because he's you can take him out with you. Yeah, and he's got skills and then and shoot stuff. him. <laughs> he seems like he's a companion. Yeah. So that's one was specifically trait enabled. So I feel like there'll be a bit of a mix on how you get them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, and then you, they can just phone up the hotline for generic crew members if you need yeah. some generics and yeah just hire a pilot for your ship yep. Ta -da! like pizza delivery yep and question when we assign crew members to work at outposts do we have to pay them salaries aka do we have to be good employers or can we be terrible <laughs> will says one time payment which you can negotiate over and which can be affected by some of your player traits we did have a lot of discussion about implementing a recurring cost or percent cut of your loot, but in the end, a simple upfront hire fee won out. Emil says, you just pay them once. We actually experimented with paying them regular salaries, but ultimately decided to just have the one up cost, one cost upfront even. There's a lot to do in Starfield, and we wanted to minimize what the player has to constantly keep track of. Makes sense, we're yep. terrible employers. Yeah, yeah. That does make but, sense. Yeah, that, that is nice and simple. I hope they made the salaries, like, significant as well, seeing as it's a one-time thing. I hope it's not just, like, the equivalent of, like, a hundred gold in Skyrim or something, where <laughs> it's the amount you never think about. Yeah. I hope it's at least enough that you're like, oh, do I want to spend this, or do I want to save it? Like, it shouldn't break the bank necessarily, but it should be something to give some consideration to. Yeah. Like Kenchi. No, Kato. Okay, keep... Just read the next question. No I'm going to keep talk. bringing it up. No. Okay. <laughs> Will companions be able to level up their perks? Will says, all crews start with a set of perks at specific ranks. So you might meet a character that's specifically good at 
especially good at rifles, and you hire them to watch your back. Or you might meet an astrodynamics expert that will increase the grab jump range when assigned to your ship. Um, Emil says they don't level up, but they come at different ranks depending on the companion. So this makes it sound like there are there could be like rare, more valuable companions when it comes to certain skills. Mm-hmm. Or uh, since it's about 20, it could just be like an fairly even spread of like this one is really good at these two things maybe these three things yeah. um very mean, once again the direct showed us perhaps. a little bit of skills and stuff and it does seem like characters have their specialities yeah and yeah getting the right person for the right job will be quite easy by the looks of it like or easy to figure out because there's no leveling up and stuff so mm-hmm. yeah I just I just hope they're they're all kind of readily available if you want to build a certain direction you need like like for like weapon upgrades for example if if you would rather have somebody else so you can you can build out min max for your your combat skills mm-hmm. and then you find somebody to crew your ship to help you with your weapon upgrades or weapon modding yeah it'd be um, nice if you can bend and stuff work supplementary which yeah. actually ties into the next question a bit. Will their perks stack with ours? And Will says, I don't know if all overlapping skills stack. We do a lot of last minute balance tweaking, and sometimes even we're surprised when two things collide and blow out our numbers. But I think crew make the most impact when they have skills you don't have, especially on your ship. Emil says, well, we call them skills in Starfield. Not perks. And then he kills the person who asks the question. Uh, <laughs> and they do stack with yours when relevant. Some are there for flavour to highlight the companions' backgrounds and interests, but you'll really feel the benefit of the ship and combat-related ones. Getting a boost to your shields or seeing your companion laying down fire with a weapon they're proficient in are pretty sweet moments. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Bro, Ooh. I don't have anything. Okay. I, don't, I don't have anything really to add to that. I just think no, it's nice. I, I think it pretty much goes with what you were saying and just ties into that nicely. Mm-hmm. So. Next question. We've only got one, two, three, four left. <gasps> nice. Be about about the right time too. Uh, what are a few of your favorite moments of the game? Ooh, we're getting spoilers. Uh, not really. Uh, Will says, "I love finding content that I haven't seen yet or forgot about. Our games are so big that no one person is likely to have seen it all. Even after all our passes." Say, really? We sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go on, carry on. <laughs> Even after all our passes and levels of review, our quests really involve really evolve over development and it's great to see how everyone adds to them. Designers, animators, voice voice actors, lighting everything. Emil says, "Shipping it is his answer." But seriously, yep. folks. <laughs> because of my position, my experience is a little different. I've seen every quest line, every city, every major piece of content in the game at every stage of development. So for me, the real pleasure is seeing how they've all evolved into the versions they are today. The versions everyone here will play. Uh, I have a real soft spot for Neon. Getting that city nailed down took a lot of work by a lot of different people, and the result is really the cyberpunk settlement I always hoped it would be. Uh, I also love all the quest lines. I think they're the best we've ever done. The designers on this project really killed it. Or totally killed it. Um, I do different playthroughs with different characters. I always make my spy slash assassin dude. One of my characters now is a version of the barbarian character I play in all kinds of fantasy games. I have a scumbag space outlaw dude. All kinds of play styles. That's that's a weird addition to favorite. Oh, I guess it is does count favorite moments. It's favorite play styles and stuff. Um, cool. Uh, looking forward to it, I guess. This is... yeah. These are these are very generic answers. <laughs> I mean, I like the fact that one of the answers was essentially builds. Yeah, that's just reassuring for me, I guess. I yeah, it, it's it's uh, a it's validating for for what you do. So yeah, that's good. That's a good so thing. So many build videos, yeah. all of them. Five hundred build videos, all guaranteed. Of them. Yep. I definitely won't get sick of the game at that point. <laughs> it's not like I managed 75 at most. Move over, Skyrim. Time for 100 Starfield builds. I, I genuinely think I could hit 100 Starfield builds. Really? 
Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a single-player Bethesda game that I'm covering from launch, which I've not uh. done before. Like, I did 76 from launch, but builds and that were like, hey, what wh- about if you just have the 0.0000003% chance of getting more than you want? <laughs> and obviously Skyrim I covered years and years after it was out, so... Yeah. Yeah. I, there's potential for me to hit 100 builds in Skyrim. Oh, it's Starfield, oh. not Skyrim, not Skyrim. I'm never going back to Skyrim. Stop <laughs> saying Skyrim, everyone. God damn it. <laughs> what books or movies had a big influence on some of the quests? Will says, I'm a history nerd, so I actually like, so I actually listen to a lot of podcasts like Hardcore History and the History of Rome. While our game is science fiction, I like how historians can tell you about how human beings react to extreme circumstances, like war, famine, and technological breakthroughs, and you can imagine how we'd react to similar circumstances in a fictional setting, just at a grander scale. We do love writing in-game books, and I was a fan of the Greek and Norse myths as a kid, the stories are very big, and characters are flawed and have clear motivations. Emil says, I'm a child of the late 70s, early 80s, and I have very fond memories of the sci fi of that time. Star Wars, OG Battlestar Galactica, Space 1999, Buck Rogers, Battle Beyond the Stars, Ice Pirates, and let's not forget the classic that is Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Finn. That's how you pronounce it correctly for those who want to know but also much headier sci-fi stuff like the writings of Arthur C. Clarke and Robert Heinlein or films like Contact, Interstellar 2001 A Space Odyssey and even Event Horizon in all of those examples you realise that outer space is two things one, a source of mystery and wonder sometimes terror and two, a giant blank page on which you can write any story and we have written a lot of very different stories in Starfield I love space games, love the original Elite and Elite Dangerous, Privateer was a huge influence. Was Cowboy Bebop inspiration? Oh hell yes. And I also love The Expanse, so yup. Just a couple of things. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) I like how Will's like, oh well real real world history is interesting and Emil's like, here's 10,000 things to recommend. (laughs) Why are waiting for Starfield to release in two weeks? Yeah, I also Here's follow a... me on Twitter, and he's recommended stuff which isn't on that list. Wow. Yeah, I think just recently, I'm gonna Google now. I think his most recent tweet was, uh, oh, where was it? Come on, come on, come on. No, uh, oh, was it not him? Oh no, it was a different person who did it. Okay, fine, 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 fine. His most recent tweet is just saying that console wars is dumb. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's the pinned one. Yeah. I mean, it's from three hours ago. Makes sense. This is the most recent one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He's also recommended a bunch of other stuff on there. But yeah, there, there's some of the inspiration. Hopefully, like, some of that stuff appeals to you. I've watched very few of the things on the list. Yeah. I've seen Interstellar. I've seen some of the Star Wars movies. I've seen Star Wars also. But yeah, uh, next question. (laughs) What are some of your favorite small details in Starfield that add to the immersion? Immersion. Emil says, I think what I really love is that all the humans are living in space and our aesthetic is very much NASA punk. This is a very lived in universe and you can see it everywhere. You know, everyone loves the sandwiches, Uh, but it's the books that are lying around the notes on bulletin boards the environmental storytelling uh, that our level designers and world artists are so good at totally love the work from our voice actors too and the music and the sound effects and clothes buttons we do love our buttons buttons Will Will says uh, I look really closely at all our outfits Uh, you can see seams materials especially on the spacesuits Uh, constellation members have patches on their spacesuits and they're tied to what skills they have uh, we love buttons. There's a lot of buttons. Okay, so this buttons. is something that concerns me. I know it's a space game with spaceships and cockpits with lots of buttons and levers and knobs and handles and all that kind of stuff. The amount of emphasis on buttons and control panels. You remember when they said that about Fallout 4 as well? No. You don't? I do. Nope. Because Dude, my memory doesn't stretch back that far. <laughs> uh, it, 
It, it doesn't need to. It, it's it's one of the worries that I have for for these kinds of games is while they may take pride, and I I'm not trying to take this away from them. Why they may they may take pride in these kinds of things like the ridiculous amount of buttons and uh, tape decks in the case of Fallout and stuff like that. Largely, players don't notice or really care. I'm speaking broadly, mainly just for myself, but it doesn't seem like players super duper care about that kind of thing. Um, like how many how many buttons are on the consoles or how many, you know, what pattern things are lighting up in and stuff like that. That seems like a ridiculous amount of detail that not enough people are going to appreciate. That's fine. It's not there to be appreciated. It's there because it makes the world look better. This is a thing you have to do with, like, movies and stuff constantly, where you have to make everything kind of look beautiful, and all of the background stuff that no one's ever going to pay attention to has to look right, and you have to add these details, and it has to make sense. Or else there's something at the back of your brain going like, oh, this is a bit empty, or, oh, this place is a bit boring. This stuff isn't there to be, like, appreciated except by the people who love to shove their face into a wall and go, oh, look at the screw. It, it's important for not being appreciated, but just existing and making the world just feel more real, feel a bit more alive. That's the real purpose of it. Yeah, there's there's making things feel real and then placing emphasis where there doesn't need to be. That's more of what I'm talking about. I mean, this is their favorite small details. Small details. Okay. I guess it does answer the question. <laughs> oh, did you forget it was a small details question? I did forget it was a small details <laughs> okay. question. That makes more sense, though. The buttons are small details. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, you if can tell, was, like, you can tell how tired I am main now, too. Of, Sky, of Star Wars. Yeah. Um, I'm hot as well. Yeah, the rain well, stopped. <laughs> the, hot dang again. it. Well, this is, here's the hill I'm dying on for this for this podcast because I forgot what the question was. Yeah. All right. Final question. We're always done. Oh, what is no. the history behind the mechs? Uh, and Emil answering this one solo. Ooh, the mechs. Good one. So we showed this a bit in one of the animated shorts. The mechs are leftovers from the colony wars. Note, it's Colony War, and not Colony Wars, singular. He said wars! He did. He later went on and apologised for that. Emil, fix it! and stuff. <laughs> Both sides, United Colonies and Freestar Collective, had mechs. But the Freestar Collective really mastered them. The United Colonies had mechs too, but they also relied on the controlled alien beasts from their Xeno Warfare Division. Both of those were outlawed with the armistice that ended the Colony War. So mechs are not usable, no. They're in ruins. But I'm not saying there's an old mech battleground in the game. I'm just typing it. Uh, okay. Mechs confirmed. Uh. There are mechs. You're not going to be piloting them. No! I mean, I'm pretty sure we, we already had that. confirmation of no ground vehicles. We don't know that, would, Sarge. I mean, it does say, uh, <laughs> what's the specific line? Mechs are not usable. We don't know I mean... that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is what I expected. An interesting bit of lore. I do wonder how the whole colony war that semi recently happened okay. will tie in with characters and stuff. Well, if there's no mechs, they. No, no pilots. Emil, Emil did mechs. mention that they. That the United Colonies also relied on the controlled alien beasts from their Xeno Warfare Division. And so, we have seen that as a gameplay thing. What? We saw it in the Starfield Direct. Where? where? Huh? Xeno Sociology, right? Oh, the skill. It's in the Direct. Yeah. Yeah, not the Xeno Warfare Division. Oh, no, we don't see the and certainly not, division. And certainly not controlled alien beasts that you could what, ride, what? potentially. There's no riding mentioned there. Riding's not going to happen, Kato. This is what everyone does. They're like, oh, okay, here's a logical step. Oh, no, how about I take another one? It's I'm in another rideable one. space I'm in another one. death claw, I'm in another Sarge. One. I'm in another one. And you've taken 20 steps away from the thing you originally had. Yeah. Each one on its own so seems we're fine. Gonna, That's we're just gonna, a small little thing, and it's a we're, giant leap. We're going to strap rockets to a, to an alien, and we're going to ride it into space. That's not going to be in the game. <laughs> 
<laughs> Everyone does this, and then they're like, God, this game sucked. Why didn't have all the things they <laughs> promised? Todd Howard's such a liar. God. <sighs> I've seen I'm, this too many times. I'm all for tempering expectations, but we can also have fun with it. I don't think we can. I don't think I can trust people <laughs> enough. <laughs> no fun allowed until people are smarter. Mechs confirmed, but they don't work. Also, we can strap rockets to space death claws and <sighs> go go into the stars, the field of them. Well, and then and then we can pick pick the stars from the star field, and then bring them back to, I don't know, neon, and then sell them. Those Boom. were all the questions. <laughs> I'm not sure if we've given you more or less information than you had before at this point. Yeah. But yeah, uh, if you want, like, the full answers to actually reference, which you probably should, um, we have that linked in the description below, yep. so you don't have to hear us stumble over our words and definitely die on hills that we probably could have gone without, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> we both were just like, no, this one, this is the way we're going. <laughs> oh, well, besides... Dying on hills. What you been up to, Kato? So many hills. Uh, there's a lot of hills in Baldur's Gate Three. Oh no! And I, I may have died on them. Somebody died on them. <laughs> may not have been me every time, but Baldur's Gate Three is ridiculously big. It is <laughs> so packed to the gills with content. Um, I, I haven't beaten it yet. Like I'm in the final act. I think, but I, I haven't beaten the game yet, and I don't know how Starfield's gonna compete. <laughs> See, I, I, uh, this bugs I, me a bit that so many people are comparing, like, Baldur's Gate and Starfield, and I think they're just gonna be different experiences. I think that's they, the best way to look at them. That is That is the best way to temper your expectations, but also, like, I, I think Baldur's Gate 3 is so good it may ruin some other games for you. <laughs> like, it, on its own, like, we've already talked about, like, the stories of misquoting on social media and stuff like that, like, Baldur's Gate 3 being an anomaly and blah, blah, blah. Um, but the amount of content in a single game, it, this one in particular, is is outrageous. It's so hard to even put into words. Like like the world serpent that we were talking about earlier. It big. It big. <laughs> There's too much there. You can't experience it just in one go. Um, That's good. It, like, imagine the Witcher 3 level of uh, consequences and payoffs. Multiply that by two or three. Like it's it's a lot, <laughs> and it's a D and D game, so there are like different puzzles. Like I've run into the majority of the puzzles of the game are a lot of fun to kind of solve. Some of them are like combat oriented puzzles, um, but you can apply your tabletop logic to different aspects of this game, and it is mind blowing what you can get away with. Like what the what the devs considered when when they were like, oh, we're just gonna make this puzzle this way, um, and here's a here's a couple of different ways you can approach it, and uh, for example, there is a puzzle where you need to turn some statues to have them face a specific direction, very generic, you know, dungeon uh, puzzle type of thing. Um, one of them is jammed. Like, one of the gears in them is just jammed up. Um, so, from a tabletop setting, what do you think the DM would allow you to do? Barbarian or fighter, go smack it. Strength check. Yep, that one works. Mm -hmm. it, it Both, actually. You can attack it to move it. You can use your athletics to move it. Both both different checks. Yeah. Um, well, one's a check, one's just hitting it. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> with, with, a, with a big enough, like, weapon. Um... Mm -hmm. The other one, uh, Dakuba told me this one, uh, casting grease yep. also greases up the gears, and you can turn it that way. 
Um, there's probably other solutions to this puzzle that we don't know about yet, or I haven't discovered. Um, but that's just like a small example of the stuff you can get into. And what I was saying about the payoff kind of things, you can make decisions um, in the first act that don't really have a result or or a climax until you reach act three. <laughs> Where you're just like, oh yeah, I remember this guy. Uh-oh, he's gotten into some hijinks and I gotta help him again or something like that. And also, uh, I'm gonna geek out about this game so hard. It's gonna be the only thing I talk about. Yeah. That uh, this is the sequel to after Baldur's Gate one and two. And- That explains the name. It does. <laughs> and it's so respectful and has little nods and references and nostalgia here and there for players that have played the original ones um, and context for those that are new. Um, so it's it's like an all-inclusive contained story where you can enjoy it if you're new and you can enjoy it and get those little nuggets of nostalgia if you are familiar with it. Like, it's, it's the whole package. It's great. I'm going to probably play that more yeah. later. I mean, you've got a bit more than a week. You've got, like, what, ten more days just to play that? Yep. My first playthrough will be done. <laughs> That's right. Just ten days, like, about 200 hours, four hours of sleep a day. You'll get out of your system. <laughs> I'm getting super worried, too. <laughs> what about you, Sarge? I've done so much. I, I've got six oh. things on my list. Fallout 3, Persona 5, Redfall, Apex Legends, Minecraft, D&D. Fortunately, I can talk about each of them fairly quickly. Okay. Fallout 3, I just felt like going back to a Bethesda game before Starfall comes out. I got Fallout 3 on like Game Pass on the Xbox, so I've just casually gone into that. It's the standard edition with like none of the DLC and stuff, so ah. it's nice to see it a bit differently. And because I'm playing on console and things and don't have my awesome mouse and keyboard to go <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm doing Unarmed yeah. I think I'm figured I'd do that and I've not played too much but I've, I've had some fun with it Heck yeah. I'm, I'm happy to say I was able to disarm mines without getting blown up which is one thing I was worried about with the game with playing in the way I was but that's been fine oh good also gave Persona 5 a try because that's a series everyone's like yeah it's amazing you should play it I'm about hour, hour and a half in I'm kind of wondering when I get to start properly playing it. <laughs> I've really just walked forwards and hit, like, that A button, and that's it. Hmm. There's not really much I've done, and I'm not sure I'll go back to it because it's so close to Starfield. Like, it might be great, but I've been playing for a long time, and I'm sure the story's interesting, but the gameplay mechanics have not been so far. It's just... It's not got a great opening, in my opinion. And I needed a good opening, considering I've got a relatively short amount of time to play it in. Then I decided to give Redfall another go. <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, it's got some cool stuff to it. But yeah. I'm, I'm not going back to it. Like, It's not a bad game. I think it would have been better with more of a single-player focus, honestly, at it's, this point. Yeah, it's, it's not... It's not... <laughs> we're not mad, we're just disappointed. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's one of those games that got, like, overly dunked on by the internet as well. Yeah. Giving it, like, zero on ones out of tens, when really it's, like, a five out of ten game. Like, it's it's, it's nothing exciting, but... Yeah. It's much more average. If, if it, like... Yeah. If it was very much, like, free of those annoying issues that it started with, um, like, it would be, it would be probably looked at more of a neutral... Yeah, kind of game. I mean, when I was playing it, I don't think I encountered any bugs, which is nice. Seems to be a bit more stable. Was Although the AI I did have to... a bit better? Um, or was it about maybe? the same? I was killing things quite effectively. Okay. So I'm not certain. I will say it did crash the first time I booted out, which wasn't a great oh, sign. Mm. But once I actually got into the game, it seemed to be working just fine. But hey, I'm not. I'm, I'll be uninstalling it because. Yeah, it just doesn't matter too much, unfortunately. What I did play a bunch of though was Apex Legends, because they they've you know it's a battle royale game. They got the battle pass and whatever. Who cares? 
What they introduced this time, which was really cool, was the ability to unlock one of the heroes, who otherwise you need to, like, earn to unlock by just getting the generic currency or pay real money to unlock. They gave specific challenges where you get to play as that hero and unlock them by completing challenges. And that's such a cool idea. I love that they did it. Got me playing a lot of the game. Got me trying out different modes in the game as well. Because there were, like, four different things you needed to do. You needed to be around people when they die. You needed to jump a bunch. You needed to kill people while using your ultimate. And you needed to deal damage. The hmm. jumping a ton and the being near people when they die, super easy. Like, ridiculously easy. Yeah. Like, the jump is just the, like, standard ability you get where you do a bit of a leap and it's like, leap this many meters. You, you just do that. Being around people when you die, you don't need to be the one who deals with them. It's literally, you have like a little passive where you get a little icon who shows people who are near death. Every firefight that's going to be going off, also easy. The dealing damage. You needed to deal 80,000 damage to unlock this hero. Mm. There is a specific badge you get, which you unlock, if you deal over 2,000 damage in a match. I have it on two of my heroes, and I'm quite good at the game. Not great, but better than most, I'd say. Generally, you're looking at 80 games of a standard battle royale. That's a lot. That, that like, sounds like a that, huge, That's huge if you're grind. playing decently. So what I did instead was I went and tried the non-battle royale modes, where they have control, which sucks, and they also have team deathmatch, which is alright, it's just standard team deathmatch, and then they have gun run, which is just Call of Duty's gun game, but slightly better. And I love that they have that. It's such a fun <laughs> little party game. It is brilliant. You do sometimes get stuck with a garbage weapon, like the charge rifle, and then everyone else is like assault rifles, and you're like, well, I guess I'll just die. <laughs> but, but they also do a thing where it's team-based with all of these. So you're on like a three-person team, and the kill count basically goes up for everyone. So you don't get the same progression of weapons every time. It mixes it up. And it's hmm. brilliant. It's just really good. And I easily got the damage done with that, because I can get, like, two or three thousand damage in a match fairly easily, and it's only, like, ten minutes, maybe, to do a match. And it's much more consistent. So much better. The kills while using the ultimate was a problem, because the ultimate doesn't deal more damage and stuff. It's just, like, a shielding ability. So I was getting kills and stuff, but they weren't with the ultimate. And that's what took me a while, but I've done it now. Oh, I good. did it like four or five days ago. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Um, yeah, so I unlocked them, which I was very happy about. I also won several matches with them. I actually did surprisingly well. So yeah, it was fun. And now I don't need to play Apex Legends for many more maps. Yay! Yay. Um, I also went a bit ah at some point, so played Minecraft, because it's very chill. And that was very helpful. And it's good. Nice to do. Fun. And I've played a bit of real life D&D down at what? the pub. Because <gasps> at the my pub? Sister's, yeah, my sister's been playing D&D with a like, group of friends for a while now. And I've been offering her advice because she's playing as a ranger. Like, a, I think a half-elf ranger. Ah. But she, she's got like high intelligence when rangers use wisdom for their spellcasting. Oh, and yeah. her dexterity's not great. And like... Oh. Yeah, I was giving her lots mm. of advice and stuff. She doesn't really understand. I ended up rewriting her entire character and being like, okay, here's how you do it and here's how you build it up to this point on the like little app she's got. And eventually she was just like, you should just come with us. <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago, I went down to the pub with them and I had like a couple of minutes. So I wrote up a fighter called Avalor, who's a half orc, who uh, like I gave him a backstory and all the stats and stuff. And then I got to play with them. Nice. Because I just kind of showed up and knew what I was doing. And one of her friends did say it was quite impressive how when it gets to my turn and stuff, I'm just like, oh yeah, I'll use my bonus action for this and then I'll do two attacks. So has anyone got a D10? Perfect. There we go. Da -da -da, and that's my turn done. While everyone else is like, so I've got a bow, right? <laughs> but yeah, I, I offered a little bit of help. I played a bit of D&D &D, and I'm not going to be going back to Starfield. <laughs> Which I feel a bit bad about, but hey, that's just how it works. Kill my character. I'm I'm done. <laughs> the plan was for my character to die last time, but we oh. did no combat last time. Oh, dang it. Uh, we, we went to Dinosaur Island, 
And I was like, hey everyone, let's not beat up the dinosaurs, let's be nice to people. And yeah, amazingly I didn't die. It turns out being nice is very effective in D&D. Ah, dang it. <laughs> yeah. But hey, they've now got my character just for whatever. It doesn't matter if they die or not. And you know what? Maybe next year I'll go back and play with them. It's going to be so much Starfield. <laughs> but that's it for me, though. Played a lot of stuff. That's I'm awesome. done talking. Goodbye. Great. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Zard. Where are you going? Why are you leaving? Don't close the door. Anyway. Uh, thanks for listening to the Pipcast 3000, uh, all this nonsense of a delirious Cato and Sarge. Um, hopefully, our next episode, hopefully two weeks from now-ish, depending on how we feel when we play Starfield for the first time, we hope to see you then, and largely the next episodes are probably going to be Starfield-centric, so be prepared for that. Not again. <laughs> I can't do the outro, Sarge. Help me. <laughs> I've already gone. Ah, oh, dang it. Okay. Uh, if you want to support or subscribe or whatever, our links are in the description for our socials and merch and junk. Thank you again. Bye bye.